uh, you know what, I'm... So, uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you just introduce yourself, your name, and what you do? This is just for historical purposes. I'm Matthew Thurmond Roberts, and I currently am working as the city's Parks and Recreation Director. Well, why don't we start off with the bluffs. Uh, tell me what you know about the history of how the bluffs were used in the last 50 years and recent, the recent, more recent acquisition. It's a fascinating story because I believe Chevron purchased the bluffs sometime in the 1950s and was somewhat ambivalent about development plans. Occasionally they would come up with a development plan that was uh, proposed, but they didn't pursue it too doggedly as far as I could tell. Um, later on, local developers had an option to develop it in concert with Chevron, and they were a little more persistent. But it did amazingly galvanize the community to preserve the bluffs as open space. And at a time when the Los Angeles area had just sort of built out and so much open space was lost, so much agricultural land was lost to urban uses, it was a fascinating effort to preserve a 53-acre piece of coastal bluff in Southern California, which would be considered by most realtors to be the most prime uh, residential real estate anywhere. But somehow Carpentry pulled out a little miracle and it's now an open space preserved forever. Nice. Uh, that was well put. Um, were you a part of the, pro the, the process of acquiring it? That's a good question because the city was being sued at the time and it had to keep an arm's length from the acquisition effort. However, I believe the city's interests were being served by pursuing preservation of the property. I am certain the city council was extraordinarily, um, I could, I'd like to start that over. Is this, this doesn't do that, does it? Well, no, <laughs> but, but in terms of if you say that, then I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use that in the document. Well, I, I'm still kind of uh, trained not to say anything that might be litigious. <laughs> but basically the city was being sued. By the way, I should say, if, if you think you, and that's a good point, if you think you said anything that could be litigious, point it out to me and I will make a note to not do it. Okay. Anymore. I still try to choose my words carefully. Okay. That's my point. But the city was being sued by the developers because they felt there was a breach in their rights and was defending that lawsuit. So we were is from a city perspective, we were keeping an arm's length while the land trust for Santa Barbara County and the citizens for the bluffs pursued the acquisition. At some point, the land trust was successful, the citizens were successful, the land trust actually purchased the property from the developer and then turned around and sold it to the city at a very, very advantageous price. That additional funding the city gave toward the project completed the funding required to uh, get complete title to the property. Uh, that was well played. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you're very articulate. For the record, Matt's very articulate. <laughs> yeah, leave that in. Okay, I want to edit that out. Um, so now, um, does, tell me about how it's now managed and what's up there. There's 53 acres of open space, and the fundraising effort, in order to have the broadest appeal to the community, included an athletic component. So that's why you see the Viola Fields, who was uh, the gentleman who donated a quarter of a million dollars toward the acquisition of the property overall got naming rights to the fields and named the fields after his mother Viola. And so, what was his name? Jim D'Arkland. And that was a very successful effort. He stayed on the Bluffs Advisory Board for a while to oversee the sports component. Um, we were able at that time to get some development money from various park bond acts. Um, occasionally when the state of California puts out a Parks Bond Act and we approve it. Um, often the projects that are produced from it are forgotten. But in this case, the Viola Fields were developed with bond money from a Parks Bond Act that was floated in the state of California. Um, so everything fell into place. The property was acquired. There was development money available. We were able to build the Viola Fields first and then a couple of years later, another Bond Act came up. We were able then to build the restroom out there. Another funding source came up and we were able to complete the trail that runs along Carpentria Avenue. Um, Chevron had an obligation to fund the trail that runs along the railroad tracks and they were good to their word and funded that trail. And all of the components came together to get the complete project you see out there today. Um, even still, there is something known as a conservation easement 
This is a legal document that the Land Trust for Santa Barbara County has possession of. So they have rights to ensure that we, the city doesn't do anything out there that's inconsistent with the original vision for the property as was stated by the Citizens for the Bluffs and the Land Trust at the time of acquisition. So each year the Land Trust comes out and does a visual inspection and makes note of any deficiencies. Our track record with them has been very good. And it's important to also point out that the Citizens for the Bluffs raised more than the acquisition price and have uh, actually created an endowment fund that contributes to the overall maintenance of the property uh, every year. In fact, uh, as we speak, it's about $26,000 a year that that endowment fund contributes to the maintenance of the property overall, which is a very significant amount. Well, what would you say is the value of <coughs> open space to people in the community of like the Bluffs? The value is almost measureless. Um, because it goes way beyond a visit where you go out and find yourself, have a little peace and quiet, maybe spend time with your family, maybe spend a little time with your dog. Um, the visual aesthetics of it are also very important, just knowing it's there for you all the time, giving it unfettered visual access to the Channel Islands, the National Marine Park out there, the, the, the channel itself, uh, is extraordinarily refreshing. Um, the, having athletic fields out there is unusual as well and we hear from people who visit that those are the fields they want to play on because the air that comes off the Pacific is so fresh and so healthy. But beyond that it sets a very remarkable statement about what Carpinteria has always stood for and what I hope Carpinteria will continue to fight for in the future which is its place as um, almost an environmental preserve for the whole community, not just out on the bluffs. But if you look at the cornerstones of our park system, um, the Marsh Park was a heroic effort to reclaim what was once wetland. It was filled, the part that's the city's park anyway, was once filled with dirt to make way for condominiums. And that was clawed back and turned back into its wetland form. The bluffs is the other side of the picture. The trail that we're building through the community, um, all the parks that are within it, and there's so much more that I could uh, hope we could accomplish in the future to establish Carbonaria as an environmental uh, centerpiece in the coast of California. Could, could you say that, you know, put that into words again? Somehow, <laughs> somehow say it more intelligently. <laughs> well, maybe a sound bite that uh, works well. But <clears throat> some, so your point is the whole town of Carpinteria is kind of an en environmental if you go back and read some of the writings uh, of early days in the turn of the last century, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, uh, Elizabeth Montgomery Ward's writings in 1911 in a little booklet called La Carpinteria, and she comments how gorgeous Carpinteria is. And one would think back in 1911, visual open space and beauty would be everywhere. It's long before the San Fernando Valley was built out and long before Santa Barbara looks like it does today. Yet in 1911, people were inspired to write about the natural beauty of Carpinteria. That's really telling to me. And even now, Carpinteria maintains that position where from our aesthetics, from our access to the mountains and our access to the sea and the resources within our watershed are unique and precious and it is certainly worth our wild and worth the interest of the community to continue to celebrate those and preserve them and to find a way to make that our economy. To make it our economy? To make it our economy. Uh, how so? Um, well, uh, tourism, for instance, is a wonderful uh, industry that will draw on visitorship to these natural resources. Uh, education. Our ed institutionalized education, I will strike that, but um, <clears throat> if we start to emphasize environmental sciences, marine sciences, marine biology, watershed management, we have that all here in Carpinteria. So you could have an academic institute that would be driven by those environmental sciences that has access to the actual resources, not study them from a distance, but right here in our own community is the classroom that holds all of that. It holds wetlands, it holds water sciences, it holds uh, access to the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary, it holds coastal bluffs, harbor seal rookeries, uh, geo interests with the petroleum industry. There's a lot here that could be very academic and academics is a very good economic driver.
Don't edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Larry Blue, uh, for the record, it was my phone. <laughs> Uh, let's go to uh, the Marsh and Marsh Park. Um, let me get a time code note here. Ten, <coughs> the Marsh. Um, maybe give me a little background of what was going on at the Marsh and and how uh, any issues to do with the Marsh Park and and super, uh, the Marsh that you're familiar with. Go ahead. All right, the Carpentry Salt Marsh Nature Preserve or Reserve. Oh boy, <laughs> I don't even know what it's called. The Covering Your Summer's Nature Park. Okay, uh, and I'll have you start over one more time. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. The Carpentry of Salt Marsh Nature Park it was a 10 year planning effort, and it started before I got involved. The uh, UC, or the University of California's reserve manager, Wayne Farron, was the one who I believe deserves the most amount of credit for driving that project to its completion. 10 years of collaborative building, 10 years of funds seeking, 10 years of planning, all resulted in the Marsh Park as we see it today. And I got involved probably in the last trimester where things started to come together. About when? Uh, and when did probably it about 1990. I, I was, um, I want to say it was probably about 1995 I might have been involved. Um, but it started in, in the late 80s? Or? Oh, I think so, yeah. So the, 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 with such an environmentally complicated project, it required a lot of studies to do a baseline of what it was existing, to do empirical research to find out what it was, and to then craft a plan to bring it back and restore it. Quite a uh, academic, you know, quite a intellectual product. And took quite a team of experts to do it. And the beauty of it was the collaboration that existed between all the landowners, the UC Reserve System, the state of California who prioritized wetlands restoration, the city of Carpinteria was clearly a, a big part of it. And the net result is a beautiful park that um, I think originally had some controversy uh, because what are we gonna do putting a park down there? But now uh, it's got just wonderful visitorship. It's enhanced the neighborhood's property values. It's a real joy and a real jewel in the city's uh, park system. Nice. Um, just wondering if there's any other questions. Or I, could, I could add that uh, sure. um, as they were doing the development of the Marsh Park, an opportunity arose. And this was the project that I was the point person on. But it was the um, boathouse and the uh, public restroom there. But as I grew up, I was always fascinated with the uh, reef off of Carpinteria. And when I would visit this community, always go off to the reef almost every day. And I just felt that was such an important experience for me as a kid that I was driven to try to create that for our program uh, so that everybody could come down to the beach and get into a kayak and experience the reef or the surfboard. So the boathouse there, that big garage at the end of Ash Avenue that we store all that equipment in, was really driven by um, my experiences as a child here in Carpinteria, and I wanted to have that be a persistent experience for all kids here. And when was that built? In 1997, simultaneous with the Marsh Park. So we built it all at once. Uh, 1354. For those that don't know, uh, what is the reef, where is it, and, and what's it like? That's another giant environmental asset we have in Carpinteria is the Salt Marsh Park is right next to an offshore reef. And that's a very unique relationship. So to the west of the Carpinteria City Beach, it's a point or a headland known as Sand Point. And that name comes from back in the 30s or even earlier. But if uh, you go back prior to the Santa Barbara Harbor, prior to the seawall that's been built there, that was a big sand spit. And it was put on the charts as Sand Point. Just offshore of Sand Point is a big reef, and I usually say it's five acres of submerged tide pool. So it makes a wonderful kayak destination and a wonderful snorkeling, snorkeling destination um, where you can literally go off and paddle over uh, a big, giant, uh, rocky bottom. And it has all of the elements that you might experience if you walk over a tide pool. Hmm. Well, some people don't know about that, I suppose. It, I, I, I you think you're right, but if you go down to the beach on a day when there's little surf and maybe a low tide and you look offshore, you'll see a shoaling area where the waves are breaking, and that's uh, the shallowest part of the reef. Back in the day, could you walk on the sand spit? 
Um, back on the day, if you look at some of the old uh, USGS surveys, you can see that there was a big tail of sand that came eastward and the exit or the outwater of the marsh also came eastward. So there was a, a big river there, really, that you had to cross. And some of the owners out on Sand Point would build a dock or a pier to make a connection so they could get to the ocean beach because their homes were behind where it was just that river beach, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I do have some video of that. Oh, huh. okay. But that would have been before 65, I guess. Oh, way back, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I see a Chumash person behind you, and the Chumash are known for their tomals. Is there some relationship with riding a kayak today and tomals, or any anything you'd like to say about that? It, that's that's fun. I always kind of found it to be more than a coincidence that Carpinteria had the world's champion dory rowing team in the early '60s, and that was Paul Hodgert and Jeff White. They were featured on ABC Wide World of Sports in the days of black and white live television. And that was a very proud moment. And I always felt maybe there was a connection between that and the Shumash and the Tomals and how Carpinteria doesn't need a harbor because we're excellent surf boatmen. I wonder if I can, uh, since it was early 60s, whether that can, you know, 65 and on, uh, is there some connection 65 and on to the rowing champions? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure when they stopped competing. Um, there used to be the lifeguard championships used to be held on Carpinteria State Beach. They moved south, I think, after a while. I remember that as a child. That would be a big event, and you go down and watch the rowing uh, and some of the other events. But I don't really have a connection. Don't know what, uh, after 1965, um, other than I know I was constantly coming through the surf zone with my rowboat and uh, just experiencing the reef. I'd love to go out and fish out there and snorkel and uh, a lot of fun and it's still there today. So it's, I think it's pretty healthy today as well. So if one wants to fish out there, what, what does one need? A fishing license? <laughs> yes. Um, that's an interesting point about Carpinteria is the state of California in about 1972 granted fee title to the city of all of the submerged and tidal lands in our jurisdiction out two miles to sea. Not many cities have that fee title. And yet the state still regulates that for fish and game purposes. So yes, if you want to take anything on our city beach, you need a fishing license. Um, let's see. Uh, along those lines, you covered the bluffs, the marsh park. Um, how about talk about the coastal trail? What, what is that and where does it run? We've been working for a decade at least and even more on making a pedestrian, bicycle, multi-user trail that connects the eastern portion of Carpinteria with the western portion. This trail can be described as going through the marsh park. It makes a connection um, down the beach. We've worked on the Tomal Interpretive Play Area and the Palm to Linden Trail, which is within the boundaries of the state beach, is a cooperative project with California State Parks. The trail continues through the state beach until it hits the city's Tar Pits Park, then goes behind Chevron's, or I take that back, behind the Oil Pier parking lot. Um, there's a little gap that we hope to close uh, very soon between um, the Bluffs and Tar Pits Park, but uh, we also then hope to connect the trail all the way down to Rincon County Park. And we have a design that we're processing now about that. It's a future project we hope to see completed in the next maybe two years. The ultimate result would be a coastal trail um, that runs about five miles long. that will go through some of the most remarkable environmental assets on the coast of California. So you'd not only see something like the Salt Marsh Park and have uh, visual access to the Carpentria Reef, down one of the finest beaches in California for, for just general family activities, which is the Carpinteria City Beach, through the Tomal Interpretive Play Area and through the Carpinteria Campground, which is a wonderful resource for the state. Um, you see the Carpinteria Creek, which is a wonderful steelhead uh, creek, the asphalt seeps, the harbor seal rookery, the tide pools off of Asphaltum Point, the um, a Carpinteria Bluffs, 
all again within the backdrop of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary where you can watch harbor seals and uh, sea lions and you, there's no shortage of watching dolphins and whales in season. These are all a very, very uh, a powerful experience. Do, what's the deal with the dolphins and whales? Are they, are they here year-round? Are they certain? Um, you know, we have a local resident population of bottlenose dolphin, which are coastal dolphin, and they stay very close to shore. They patrol northbound and southbound. Um, many times they can be seen daily, practically, or multiple times a day. The seals are also here all the time, but the rookery area is more seasonal when the city closes the beach in front of the seal rookery from December to the end of May. Um, but whales are real seasonal and mostly it's gray whales that migrate in the spring northbound on their way back to Alaska. They tend to migrate very close to shore when they're heading northbound. I'm told when they head southbound they go on the other side of the island so they wouldn't be visible. But in the season, the springs, if you are watchful along the coast, especially um, in the areas where there's a little bit of a height, like at the bluffs, there's a good chance you'll see some spouts and some whales, and it's a really nice experience. The, the dolphins, uh, you said they patrol the coast. Uh, what are they patrolling for, and what are they doing, and about how far might they go in their day or in the season? You know, I'm not sure. I've never gotten any real data on that, but I see them off Carpinteria um, practically every day, and when I visit down there, um, but I also see them in Santa Barbara and I also see them in Ventura. So I'm not sure it's the same population or more than one group, but they just seem to patrol up and down the coast on a regular basis. So they're not migrating, they're, they kind of keep to an area. They seem to be resident population, yeah. And, and, and I know kayak, I've been out kayaking and they've kind of played with me in a sense. Do, do you know if, that's, if they're really aware of the people? And I'm certain they're aware of the people. They're very intelligent animals, and they seem to be very amicable to um, getting close, but um, no one would recommend approaching them. You know, they're wild animals, uh, but they're beautiful to look at from a distance. Nice. Uh, let me pause tape for a moment. Uh, I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me until uh, now, but let's see, 2248, uh, Roberts Beach. Front litigation. I, I'm, I'd like to talk about any contentious things along the waterfront in the last 50 years. Uh, can you tell me about any of that? Well, if you're referring to the uh, time when the city of Carpinteria wanted to confirm its ownership of the sandy beach, there was the lawsuit that was filed, and I think it was Roberts versus the city of Carpinteria, which was my father. And he was a named person, but it really was all of the beachfront owners. It wasn't just my dad. And um, the way those legal things work is they had to use a name, so he volunteered his. And all of the owners along the beachfront had grant deeds, which described property that went all the way to the water's edge. And this is what they purchased, and this is what the grant deed said they had purchased. The city maintained that there was a surveyed street out on the beach that was never built called Ocean Avenue. So the argument was simply, does the city have title to that Ocean Avenue because it was surveyed once as a street, or did the property owners along the three blocks of City Beach have title because their grant deed said they did? And the answer was never really determined, but a settlement was agreed upon where 30 feet north from the center line, well, that's not true, Ocean Avenue was 80 feet wide. The 30 northernmost feet was to become part of and confirmed as part of the landowner's property and the 50 feet seaward was to be used as a public beach and so it was resolved after some amount of time and some debate but it was resolved amicably to that um, unlike the beach to the west none of the owners along the city stretch ever fenced off or ever tried to exclude the public and um, maybe that was one of the motivations for the people on the West to uh, sort of emphasize their private beach, uh, to somehow claim it. But 
Ocean Avenue, nevertheless, was just a paper street and it provided an opening for the city to confirm its public beach interests. Um, but uh, I don't think that the, city, the public would have ever been excluded from that stretch. Well, about what years was that? I, want, I don't remember. I, sorry, I can't remember when that was, when it was resolved. Okay, no problem. Um, then the other litigation was the rock plot walls, and I think you referred to further west. Can you oh, right. tell me about that? What area was that? There was a litigation from the Sandyland Cove Homeowners Association, I believe, and they were sued by the Coastal Commission um, because the state owns all title and submerged lands. When the Sandyland Cove homeowners reinforced their rock seawall, that runs from roughly Ash Avenue westward out to the end of Sand Point. It was alleged that they built it on tidal lands, which they don't have ownership or the right to improve. So the state originally ordered them to remove the improvement off of the historic footprint of the seawall. Um, and it went into litigation. And after uh, a certain amount of debate, it was decided that the rocks could stay on what was then state land but that the Cove homeowners would contribute to the Salt Marsh Park project. And the parcel of land that is right along the ocean was the parcel that they contributed the funds to purchase. And as it stands now, uh, the rocks are considered private property of the Sandland Cove homeowners, but if they're buried in sand, if it's sandy, then the public has the right to be there. So that line moves depending on whether it's winter or summer or uh, a rough, uh, you know, a rough ocean day might change where the public speech is. And you say that the settlement was they donated the land right at the waterfront? They donated the funds to purchase the land. And the park isn't right on the waterfront, or is it, does that include where the boathouse is and so forth? It does. Yes, so the park does go all the way down to the sandy beach. I see. Interesting. Um, do you know the connection with the marsh of uh, when the freeway was built? Did they dump the dirt from the freeway development into the marsh and, that, and, then, and then part of the mitigation of highway stuff went to the funding? Can you talk about that? Um, it's true that part of the marsh project was funded from transportation dollars. Um, in fact, the bluffs were, was also partially funded with transportation dollars. The connection between the transportation dollars for the marsh park and building the marsh park I was told, an argument was made, that a lot of that fill dirt that filled in the marsh was originally f uh, excess soil from when they did some freeway work. I don't ever, I never had that verified, but I had heard that story. Okay. And what was the connection with the bluffs and the freeway? Um, well, the acquisition and preservation of that had broad political support, and there is a highway beautification program so it was seen as consistent with that program to provide funding to provide the open space so that the highway remains a beautiful place. Um, so that was the connection. Just, they just, every now and then you'll see a scenic highway sign out on the road. Um, sometimes that includes funding to keep it scenic. Cool. Okay. Um. Let's switch, uh, switch gears here. Agriculture. Now, you're also a farmer, right? Um, you bring up agriculture, and it's true. My great-grandfather and his brother settled in carpentry in 1869. And back then, if you weren't a farmer, you really weren't here. <laughs> what was their name? Oh, um, it was the Thurmans. And what did they farm? Um, I guess that's a tough question for me to answer, everything and anything that was going on. Um, uh, I was more familiar with what my grandfather farmed and my uh, mom's older brother. Um, but they did the things such as lemons and just a truck farm and lima beans and uh, the crops changed depending on the markets. Well, what do you farm now? Um, avocados and cherimoyas. Uh, would you? I'm going to be do, interviewing other uh, ag-related people, so you don't have to talk about it. But would you care to talk about any of the issues of uh, 
the county developed a greenhouse plan uh, and some of the, the issues that resulted from that? Yeah, I don't really have much to say about the greenhouse program, but um, I think as Carpinteria has been identified as a beautiful place to live, uh, it does put uh, pressure on the historical uses, such as agriculture. Um, things such as uh, demand for water is obviously one that needs to be discussed. Um, ag does have a big demand for water. The um, quality of water that ag requires sometimes isn't required to meet drinking water quality standards, but the urban users are very highly regulated by the federal government to meet real high standards. Um, so irrigation water and urban water don't need to meet the same standards. It's just an expensive endeavor to meet urban water standards. Um, water supply is an issue. And you go back and look at the Bradbury Dam project in the 50s, that was an irrigation project. So Lake Kachuma is looking very dry right now, but it was originally motivated to a large degree by irrigation users. In fact, the Bureau of Reclamation who owns that project, that's a federal agency, um, used to charge, and they still do charge, less for water used for irrigation out of that project than water used for urban uses. So they charge the districts more for the water they uh, take out of that project and sell to houses. Um, the, uh, so water's always been an issue for ag here. And my mother, who uh, has told me many times, the prosperity of the family depended upon the, their ability to use their water well. If the well broke, it was a family emergency. And in a way, with our water supply being so stressed now, we have a community emergency. Um, do you, can you talk about the last drought or droughts historically? And, and when was it? Um, the last drought was, uh, I believe, in the very end of 89, 90. Is that right? Uh, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah that makes I'll sense. That. Yeah. Um, my memory serves me correctly, it was um, when the issue of state water was being uh, debated yet again. Um, it had failed a couple times in the previous times, but this drought got everybody thirsty and it was broadly supported by the voters, even though there was a debate that it was never going to produce the water that was promised and it was going to be more expensive than was being predicted. And oddly, or maybe aptly, both of those things have come true. It has been extraordinarily expensive for Carpentry to, to participate in the State Water Project. And when we need it the most, there's no water in it. So uh, it's been very troubling to me. I've been on the water board since uh, 1996. And the idea that um, the community is exporting $3 million a year just to pay for the construction costs of that. Um, but then when we need it, it's, it doesn't produce much in the way of water. It has been um, very sad. And was that a period of, in about 90 when there was a, a measure to, a, a, was there something on the ballot and what, what was on the ballot then? The ballot was to uh, take out the debt to fund the southern portion of the South Coast, or not the South Coast conduit, to fund the southern portion of the um, aqueduct. Eh. There is a cal coastal branch of the California um, pipeline. That coastal branch is what was being funded, half of it through the bond measure. The other half through the State Department of Water Resources, which was going to bill us for it. But the vote to authorize construction was only about the local debt that had to be taken out to fund it. And, and was it approved? It was pr approved by a very high percentage of the voters. I, I want to say even maybe 70%. And, and if it wasn't approved, would we be in worse shape now? Is well, it's hard to say, but one of the things that might have happened is we could have used that extraordinarily uh, high amount of money over the years to look at other alternatives for water resources. Um, would we have a reclaimed water system in Carpentria if we didn't spend $3 million a year on state water pipeline debt? Um, some other choices may have been made that would have more local control and have been successful at producing local water supplies. But when you're burdened with the $3 million annual debt from water ratepayers, it's hard to shop for more water projects. Interesting. So it's about an opportunity lost. I want to say that the state water pipeline hookup hasn't been all bad. Um, the city and the water district have pulled water through that project um, 
for many years, but it's generally small amounts. And one of the big sales pitches was when there's a drought in Southern California, there is rarely, if ever, a drought in Northern California. So it was the perfect marriage between connecting your water supplies uh, with a South and North redundancy. But in this epic drought, we're finding that, boy, we have a big, severe Northern California drought and a severe Southern California drought. So there's no water anywhere. Can you say anything about the drought in uh, the early 90s, late 80s? How long it lasted, how it affected people, how people reacted? Well, you can go back and reflect on the, the prohibition of lawns in Santa Barbara, for instance. The popping up of small businesses that would come out and dye your dead lawn green. And opportunity knocks, I guess. But um, it was punctuated by a period where suddenly we got 60 or 70 inches of rainfall over the end of one winter and the uh, whole of the other. And it was um, the final exclamation point on that was uh, the March Miracle. And I can remember the Santa Barbara News Press cover page with a picture of Kachuma Dam or Bradbury Dam spilling. And I believe the headline was something like, ah, <laughs> that very, you know, that thirst quenching relief you get, you know, on a hot day with a glass of lemonade. But um, it's going to be hard to see if that will happen again. And we have no idea whether. This, how long this will go on for, right? I've, I know exactly how long it's going to go for, but I can't tell you. <laughs> I'll give you six bucks. If you don't. <laughs> All right, you're good. Listen closely. <laughs> don't look anyway. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, let's see what next. Um, yeah, on the on the stuff about this, the it's the South Coast conduit that I couldn't remember. I should be an authority in that sort of. <laughs> I just was having a mind freeze. Well, well, so, be I mean, that's those, all those terms and uh, relationships are complicated. I know, and you can't be expected to remember everything off the top of your head. Um, you don't have oh, the avo tree root rot in '67. Do you know about that? And can you that, was that a, a new story? Well, you know, that's a good point about agriculture, is that the years I've been involved, boy, have the practices changed. And we move, at least as an orchardist, the idea of sustainability um, really comes to mind. Because when I first started getting involved in agriculture, I assumed the practices of the generation before me. I was told, or I was given instructions, this is how you do it. And over time, using my own research and following the practices of my fellow growers, we found that a lot of those practices were perhaps ill-conceived. Ill, um, um, so instead of battling every weed in the orchard, instead of battling every insect in the orchard, we do things with reduced reliance on chemicals and maybe try to get our cultural practices more in concert with natural processes. Um, this leads to a lot of of soil building because the stronger your soils are, the more resistant your plants are to disease and stress. And technology has shifted as well in orchards. Um, our root rot prone topa topa trees um, would be very vulnerable to the uh, Phytophthora cinnamoni, which um, is the root rot. That fungus can spread like wildfire in a very um, biologically undiverse soil environment. But by doing a lot of mulching, you accomplish not only building the soils so it's got more biotic diversity and it's less likely you're going to have one pathogen or organism take over, but also it conserves moisture and it suppresses weeds. So here's a practice that seems very onerous where we have to take mulch and move it up hillsides, uh, a lot of back-breaking labor but it does prevent the use of excess uh, herbicides, it prevents moisture loss, and it is very sustainable to build the soils for the future. Um, were you affected by the root rot problem, your, your orchard or your friends? Yes, root rot did um, sweep through our avocado orchard, and we tried over years replanting with more uh, root rot resistant rootstocks. 
Um, and we continue to do that today. They still find uh, root, resist, root rot resistant rootstocks that outperform the last generation. Um, and we also started to plant cherimoya as we saw uh, other growers in the area doing that. And um, the cherimoyas are not susceptible to root rot at all, or at least I have not experienced that they are. So um, that became a good alternate crop. Cherimoyas, it turns out, also don't have the same water needs. They're less thirsty than avocados, but they are a very difficult fruit to grow. Well, when was the root rot problem? Was it in the late 60s? Um, I think root rot was known earlier than that, but it certainly did have a big profound impact, especially in the more susceptible soils uh, in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s. I'm just living my life, Larry. <laughs> You're just a simple lifeguard. Were you a lifeguard? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. That, you know, that's a fun thing to mention because uh, you're on or off. I'm on. Oh okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, I, I when I graduated from uh, college, I got a phone call from a friend who asked me to be a lifeguard, saying they needed people and they didn't have anybody, and would I be interested? And I, I swam in college, so I was definitely qualified on the on how strong I was in the water. So I thought, well, I need a job this summer. So I went down and I was paid $4.90 to be a lifeguard on the Carpinteria City Beach in 1980. And I've, uh, in one way, shape, or form or the other, stayed with that job until now. And I always like to look back and smile and recite that HMF pinafore phrase, which is, uh, if you polish up the handle carefully, you'll become the ruler of the Queen's Navy. <laughs> That's a good one. Um. Yeah, so I can tell you that okay. I've, um, some way, shape, or form, from the uh, first summer after I graduated from college, I've been involved in public service as a lifeguard, uh, as the beach superintendent for the city, as the parks director, and I've had a, a tenure on the water board serving a public interest since 1996. What's it been like being on the water board? Aren't you in the line of fire for a lot of angry citizens? Yeah, it's, you know, that, that's a very big character builder. Um, yes, there have been times when um, circumstances have conspired to make that a very, very tough job. Those circumstances include a time when the federal drinking water quality standards were being enhanced, our old irrigation system, because the water was built in the, a lot of the system was built, um, even predates the 50s, but it was built to serve agriculture. And the standards are being uh, changed, it has to meet drinking water quality standards. And those are totally different things. Um, so on top of the state water debt, which is $3 million a year, making our water bills expensive, and that was voted in by the public, that was not a water district decision. However, I, it predates my involvement with the water district. In fact, that was one of the reasons I got involved, was the state water project, and um, I was a vocal opponent of it at the time. But the uh, modifications we needed to make to the water district system to meet the drinking water quality standards that were to take effect in 2012 were also very expensive, including covering the Carpenter Reservoir. It could no longer be an open water reservoir that the birds could swim in or the dust could blow things into or the wind could blow things into. It had to be enclosed and so did the Ortega Reservoir. And in order to get the maximum benefit of our groundwater meeting the quality standards, we needed to have a blending tank, a three million gallon one, which also served to add redundancy to our water supply during peak demand periods. Um, the water tank serves a lot of purposes, but one of the main motivations was it helped to meet the drinking water quality standards. And those changes to meet the urban needs were also incredibly expensive and combined uh, water rates were going up pretty fast, people's bills were noticeably higher, and it did cause some very, very contentious rate hearings. Um, but uh, that contentiousness was good because it made the water board carefully consider its decisions, make sure these things were absolutely necessary, and 
um, it, we're better for it. Well, can you give me the time parameters of when these things were built and approximately? Um, boy, it, that's tough to put dates on those. Well, like at the end of the 2000? Well, State Water was voted in in 1990. It took a few years to get uh, it built. Um, so we didn't really see the impacts to our water rates uh, very high and, until we started moving into the late 90s. Um, it was really more after the year 2000 that these federal drinking water quality standards being imposed motivated us to move on covering the reservoirs and building the tank. And there's some other minor modifications that have come along too, including the water district's participation in the upgrades to the Cater Treatment Plant where all of our Bradbury dam water passes through. We obviously benefit from that water treatment plant. And that plant has just gone through a $40 million upgrade to the ozone. I mean, they installed ozone, which is a wonderful way to sanitize water without adding chemicals to it. So um, the, uh, all those costs combined lead to some higher rates. And many experts in the industry would say our rates are still not high enough uh, from uh, the level that uh, we take potable water and we transport it from the Eastern Sierra snowpack all the way through weirs and dams and hydraulic stations and pumps and treatment plants and then we bring it into our uh, bathrooms at home. <laughs> uh, and tell me again wh which uh, reservoirs were covered and approximately what periods were those in? Um, I know we were trying to beat the year, so I think about 2010 was when they were covered in that round number. Um, and which ones were they? Ortega Reservoir, which the Carpentaria Valley Water District participates 50% in the um, finances of, and the Carpentaria Reservoir, which is up by Kate School, and we participate 100% in the cost of that. Okay, good, good. Anything uh, would you care to comment about ag and housing and crowding neighborhoods to do with cost of living and, and that's not necessarily Yeah, you know, my model is I provide housing. <laughs> For your, you do? Uh, yeah, well, you know, the orchard's not a labor-intensive agricultural enterprise. Not like um, some of the real high-intensity agriculture requires a lot of workers. And so it's a different dynamic on what I do. Gotcha. Um, well, how about uh, the future of carpentry? Um, I have some specific things I could ask you about, but uh, would you care to say anything in particular? I'm lucky. I kind of covered that before. Okay. Oh, which, which issue was that? Well, I, I think it would be great if Carpentry could continue to think environmentally on preserving the finest of our environmental assets and leverage that into a good business model. That is, we obviously want to have an economy. We have to have an economy in Carpinteria in order to pay for public services and to have a quality of life that's good for Carpinterians. And how do we do that best? Um, the model of industrial renaissance, where you just to serve as a bad example, um, isn't obviously what Carpinteria needs, but something that enhances our environmental stewardship. As I mentioned earlier, the idea where we promote environmental sciences here and um, leverage the location Carpentry enjoys nestled between the Los Padres National Forest and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And all of those marine resources and watershed resources that are right in Carpentaria provide a natural opportunity, almost a irresistible opportunity to consider projects that preserve those assets uh, and study them academically. And academics can be a very good economy. Nice. Um, now, um, a, a different issue is Airbnb. I considered having a Michael Jackson. <laughs> and I caught you. <laughs> I, I get a call for you. Larry, are you? <laughs> Uh, but tell me about Airbnb and why that's in your province. <laughs> it's not in my province, okay. but uh, we, we sometimes in a small little city hall we wear different hats. And for a period of time, I was being asked to assist in 
um, the city's transient occupancy tax program. We were looking for um, internet advertisers of places to say on a short-term rental because we have a tax code which requires transients or vacationers who are here for a short period of time to pay uh, a bed tax and this is common throughout the land but there was a huge uh, increase in the number of one or two unit rentals driven by the success of the internet and uh, uh, websites like VRBO or Airbnb or Flipkey these are all sites where private property owners can advertise a home for a vacation rental. And so um, it became a matter of equity to contact folks who were renting on a short-term basis and not remitting to let them know that there was that law in effect. And it's the only fair thing to do for those folks who are renting on a short-term basis and remitting. So it levels the playing field. Um, any thoughts about gentrification, whether that will continue, whether it's good or bad? For the future. Gentrification. I'm not sure what that, how you were using that term. Well, um, prettying up everything, uh, but it, it, that's not. How, how about the issue of um, beach erosion and 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 the rising sea level and so forth? Can you comment on that in the future? Well, the 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 idea the. Um, issue of sea level rise is of great concern to Carpentria, absolutely. And how it will affect us in the future, um, I don't fully understand other than it could cause a higher frequency of coastal flood events um, and a loss of our width of Sandy Beach. Um, and it could be worse than that. But the things that we can do to improve that is to set a good model for other coastal communities and other communities at large about what are you know think wisely about our carbon footprint and our greenhouse gas emissions um, we are working with the army corps of engineers in the state of california to study that very uh, effect in carpentry and how it will affect us um, uniquely um, we're hoping that that study will result in even so much as a physical project that might help us resist some level of increased storm activity but as with mother nature wants to have her way with you, there's little you can do. Any thoughts what a physical project might be? Typical physical projects that have been done in the past um, along the California coast under the program we're working with really are just to widen and thicken the beach um, to create a, a, uh, a bigger reserve against a wave attack because a big healthy sandy beach can be a very good uh, protection against a single or maybe even two big winter storms. Um, the idea is you give up a little ground and, during a winter storm and then it recovers in the off season. Um, I've been involved doing the winter berm since 1983 um, when I first started doing the flood fighting down on the beach and that's been a successful program but... Starting in 1983? Yes. No? I'm sorry you were saying... Could, could, I'm sorry I interrupted you. That's alright. Yeah and, and um, I started lifeguarding in 1980, but in 1983, uh, found myself in a position to uh, work to fend off a very severe winter storm we had in 83. And um, we picked up that program. The city manager back then was a guy named Alan Coates, and um, he gave us a lot of latitude to work the beach in the winter, um, to pr just pretty much just to protect the homes. So we devised the idea of just bulldozing up sand and building a dike. It, that used to be an emergency response. But later we were instructed by the Federal uh, Emergency Management Association that they would prefer us to make it a planned annual program. So it evolved from an emergency response idea to the annual berm program we have today. Um, when, when you first bulldozed it up, was that during a storm and, and was it effective? It, it, was, um, it was very effective. In fact, other uh, localities up and down the coast s endured severe damage when Carpentria escaped it. Um, I imagine over the years we've saved millions of dollars of, of flooding damage that would have occurred. There was one year when we didn't get the berm up as scheduled because we were waiting on a permit from the Coastal Commission. And wouldn't you know it, in that two-week period that we were late in early December, a storm came 
And that one pre-season storm, if you will, did about $300,000 in damage um, where the waves came in and broke through a patio slider and also flooded another home. Well, when was that about? Um, that's a good question. Um, maybe 87, 1987. Um, I'm not sure the exact year, but okay. it was one of those years back then. And um, so the berm's been very effective. It really has. And the homeowners along the beachfront pay uh, a large share of that cost. The costs are apportioned based upon ownership and the city does own some lineal front footage uh, as well as the property owners. So uh, the city c contributes funds, but um, the majority of it is paid for by the beachfront property owners. Well, was an argument for that used at all about the homes that were washed away when uh, Stearns Wharf was built in Santa Barbara? And, you know, historically there was do you want to comment about that, or is that relevant? I think it's common knowledge that the um, harbor interrupted the supply of sand that moves down the coast, and that interruption did cause severe erosion of all down coast beaches for some time. I'm not certain that's still the case today because a new equilibrium has been met, um, and they do a lot of sand pumping or dredging up at the harbor and pass it along, but. There was a period of time right after that breakwater went in when beaches along uh, Montecito and Summerland and um, north of Carpinteria, Padero Lane and Carpinteria as well, um, really saw a huge loss. In fact, the sand point I mentioned earlier in this interview uh, was lost as a, um, it is thought to have been lost as a function of that harbor project. At least the harbor project contributed to its loss. And, and were homes damaged? Um, during that absolutely period. yeah during that period it caught a lot of people by surprise big winter storms one of the things that's changed dramatically since I've been involved in 1983 till today is weather science and the ability to see a storm coming and the forecasts the wave modeling um, that's available on the internet at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's websites or NOAA's websites um, is really been great we used to have to wonder in the winter whether we we're going to get a storm. We'd hear a prediction. Wouldn't have any data. Just have to respond because we have a storm prediction. Today I can look at um, the buoy data. I can look at the satellite data. I can look at the um, published wave models by some academic institutions such as UC San Diego and Scripps Oceanographic Institute where they initiate models from buoy data and predict which direction the waves are going to come from and whether that direction is a shot at Carpinteria Beach. So um, it's really been extraordinary, the advancement in weather science. And what can you do about it with the knowledge? I can determine whether I need to react or not. And how might you react? A uh, reaction to prepare the winter berm for an onslaught is to get bulldozers back on the beach on standby. <laughs> We're almost out of tape. I have a couple more questions, but I might change tapes. Let's see. Um, well, are there any other park milestones you can talk about in the last 50 years, like when parks were dedicated and built and so forth? Um, there's been a tremendous opportunity in Carpentria over the time I've been working full-time as parks director to build parks. There's been very rich times in the state treasury where funding is available. The city has wisely um, created some park funding mechanisms in its budget that allowed us to um, match grant dollars. Um, the uh, number of other opportunities, um, such as the Citizens for the Bluffs effort to uh, preserve the bluffs, um, really is phenomenal. So when you consider the inventory of parks that have gone in and the other attributes that have gone in over the last uh, decade or maybe even 15 years, it's special. And I can't enumerate them all, but the Salt Marsh Park, the Carpentria Creek Park, the Boathouse, the Tomal Interpretive Play Area, the um, Palm de Linden Trail and other trail segments all along the coast, um, the Seaside Park most recently, are uh, planned to um, uh, rehab Carpentria City Hall with some really nice park-like landscaping outside. Um, 
these are all significant advancements in our aesthetics and our quality of life and our expression of how much we want to preserve our environment. Nice. Um, do you mind if I change tapes? <laughs>